Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that doesn't ask you to sit through three hours of content with no bathroom break. I mean, don't get me wrong, you are more than welcome, nay, encouraged to watch three straight hours of content on this channel. YouTube would love me for it, and I would be rewarded with riches beyond compare. But unlike Endgame, if you need to run to the most in-demand throne in the universe, with me, you get the bonus of letting my soothing voice accompany you on your phone. Well, you're sitting there doing whatever it is that you're doing. So there was a lot to unpack in Avengers Endgame, and while I have plenty of thoughts on future theories, most of them involve time travel, or 21 movie deep lore, or figuring out what size clothes the Hulk banner combo is wearing because his sweaters go way beyond husky. Where's he getting those things? Half the population was snapped out of existence. There are not enough people around to do bespoke tailoring of your monstrous new figure. So today I wanted to start off with something a bit more basic, something a bit more fundamental mental to the entire premise of this movie. The fact that it's ridiculous. You heard me right, the entire idea of this movie happening in the first place seems impossible to me. And no, I'm not talking about time travel, I'm not talking about Doctor Strange portal battles or Tony Stark inventing time travel in less than five minutes. No, I'm not talking about his miraculous rescue from the middle of space or Thor becoming existential crisis Santa. I'm talking about this moment right here. A rat walking across a keyboard and setting Ant-Man free. When I was sitting there in the theater, and I saw this scene, I'm like, are you kidding me? You expect me to believe this? I don't care how much you love the movie. This, of all things, is how Scott Lang is getting out of the quantum realm. I mean, I am on board with everything else in this movie. Marvel, I can't get enough of character reunions. A visit to the Thanos retirement home? Beautiful. Poetic main character deaths? Heartbreaking. But you're telling me that all of that, everything that we see in the entirety of Endgame is based on a random rat stepping on a random button in some storage park parking garage. And I'm in no way exaggerating here. This isn't me trying to make this sound more important than it is to hype up this episode. Don't forget, this single rat button press is the only thing that leads to the return of Scott Lang, aka Ant-Man. For those of you who forgot, he's been hanging out in the quantum realm, an interdimensional kind of space-time soup, for over five years leading up to this movie. This rat tripping over itself on this car is the only reason he's rescued from time-space exile, which in turn is the only only reason that he introduces the idea of time travel as a possible solution to the snapping, which is the only reason Tony Stark and the rest of the Avengers get involved in the first place, the only reason he and Captain America bury the hatchet, the only reason they succeed in traveling back in time, retrieving the stones, and saving the universe and everyone who is snapped away. It literally starts here, and only here. You have got to be kidding me. This entire 22 movie franchise, the epic conclusion to over a decade's worth of movie ultimately hinges on an act of rodent randomness saving half the living universe. So rather than be annoyed by this, which honestly was what I was when I left the theater after Endgame, I decided to put my theory where my mouth was and figure out whether this was even remotely possible in the real world. What are the odds of that rat stepping on that panel? And when you stop and think about it, it shouldn't seem like that weird of a thing to do. I say to myself trying to justify my own self-imposed insanity, but seriously, this entire movie is predicated on on the whole idea of the Avengers having one chance in 14 million to beat Thanos. This entire franchise is just one massive statistics puzzle. Endgame is all about that one chance in 14 million to win when the odds are definitely not in the hero's favor. But I'm telling you going into this theory that I don't think those odds have much to do with time travel and Infinity Stones and intergalactic battles and Tony Stark taking the Infinity Stones for himself. No, I think that 99.9% .9 of those universes are all just wasted trying to get a single rat to step on an effing button. But to be sure, Sure. Let's find out, shall we? The first question is, why are you not subscribed to this channel? We cover ridiculous questions like this all the time. Secondly though, and more to the point, how in the world do you calculate the odds of something like this? This is like the world's worst Google interview question. And to be fair, as we go through this, we need to make a couple of assumptions that'll allow us to actually reach some conclusions and have a hope of finishing this episode in less than 20 minutes. So let's start with the rats. There are obviously tons in a city like San Francisco where Scott Lang lives, but we'll need 
to estimate how many there are in the area around his van, how much ground they can cover, and also the odds that one would step in a particular spot over the course of five years, because remember, that's how long Scott waits to be rescued before the magic moment happens and this entire plot of the movie can get underway. Luckily for Scott and the rest of the universe, San Francisco happens to be completely overrun with rats. This is not a joke. In 2018, there were news reports that people had to wait weeks for an exterminator because there were so many rats and not enough people to wipe them all out. In fact, San Francisco is the fourth most rat-infested city in America. I'm assuming number one is Washington, D.C. Badoom ching Political humor, ladies and gentlemen. Get dunked on, politicians! In New York, a 2014 survey estimated that there are about a fourth of the number of rats in New York as there are people. So applying this ratio to San Francisco with about 900,000 residents, we get 225,000 rats, which is just a heck of a lot of rats. If you live in a big city, maybe just don't think too much about how many rats you share your block or your apartment building with right now. The maximum range a rat is willing to travel from its nest is 50 to 150 meters, so we're gonna take the average here at 100 meters. It's bigger than the length of an entire football field in every direction. It translates to 31,415.9 square meters when you pi r squared it out. That is a huge amount of ground to cover when we want the rat to just step on a button that's like an inch square or about 6.25 square centimeters. San Francisco proper is 46.87 square miles or 121.4 square kilometers. 225,000 rats, each technically able to cover 31,415.9 square meters in their territory, means that they're technically able to cover over 7 million square meters. And as a result, could be covering the entire open space of San Francisco hundreds of times over. This is especially true when you consider that they have to stick mostly to the outdoors, sewers, and yes, storage facilities and garages. Rat Ground Zero is likely to be right in the area that Ant-Man was last seen in Ant-Man and the Wasp. That last scene where we see Dr. Pym send Ant-Man into the Quantum Realm takes place here, with the Coit Tower to the right and the Transamerica building due south. This gives us a pretty much 100% likelihood that Scott Lang's car actually falls within the territory of Plenty of Rats, which I already thought was a stretch when I started this theory, but I was wrong. There are a lot more rats in San Francisco than I thought. But okay, saying that Scott's car falls into the territory of a few rats doesn't guarantee that one will ever step on a very small button. Realistically though, we're not just dealing with one rat. You see, unlike YouTubers, rats aren't loners. They enjoy things like socializing and sharing. They live in groups. Rat colonies have a population of up to 100 rats, in fact. So if this van is in the range of some rats, it's actually going to be in the range of a lot of rats. But remember that at the end of Infinity War, half of all living beings in the universe got snapped away. That means that at the beginning of the five years, we're dealing with 50-ish rats in Scott Lang's area. So how much ground are these 50 rats covering? Well, it actually depends on how fast they're going. Once we know that, we'll be able to know how many places they could randomly step in the course of a typical rat day, and then statistically how long it would take them to step on this one button. We can estimate an average walking speed of 3.5 centimeters per second for a rat. Rats can actually move a lot faster than that because their gait or their walking slash running speed can range from 3.5 to 8.5 centimeters per second, depending on how exciting that four-year-old Twinkie on the other side of the dumpster is looking, but we're interested in what its average speed would be across its entire day. Also, knowing that a rat's stance, or the distance between its feet, is about half an inch wide lets us take the walking speed, the linear distance covered per unit time, to the area that the rat is physically covering during that time. Think of the rat as a moving rectangle that's trying to fill in all the spaces of this giant circle that is its territory, right? So knowing its walking speed and knowing its average foot placement, we're able to calculate how much area it's covering per unit of time. And that translates to 4.44 square centimeters per second. So the question now is, how long is a rat actually out there wandering around searching for food versus sleeping or doing stuff around the nest, like learning cool rat tricks or, I don't know, giving birth to the next generation? Well, rats tend to be nocturnal, which means that they're usually taking the night shift and scrounging around for food for about eight hours a day from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., no weekends off. So calculating out how long they search and the area that they're covering per second, on any given single rat day, a rat would cover 12.8 square meters. That's a teeny tiny fraction of its 31,415.9 square meter territory in total, and the rat has a teeny 
tiny chance of finding Scott's button on any given day. To be exact, that rat would have a 0.0407% chance. To be clear, that is not 4%, that is 0.04%. Let me pull out my Doctor Strange looking into the future effects, that is 1 in 2,454. If we give this rat the ultimate benefit of the doubt that we can, and say that he never goes to the same place twice in his lifetime, which isn't entirely realistic, but hey, just for the purposes of a thought experiment, it would take him, or her, 2,454 days to completely cover the entire search area. That is 6 years, 8 months, and 21 days of constant rat searching, never covering the same area twice. Now, I feel okay about this assumption because it's kind of like a big average. Realistically, if the van was close to the rat's nest, well, this button would actually have an enormous likelihood of getting hit early on. If it's on the edge of a rat's territory, on the other hand, well, the odds become incredibly low. So by spreading out the area that the rat's walking, we know we're not accurately representing real traffic patterns, but instead we're averaging things out based on the fact that we have no idea where the rat is actually starting from. So all you but actually people, take it easy. I'm trying to take as much into account as possible. And no, I'm not taking into account that the van is elevated and he's got to climb up there and all that. Yeah, I get it. We're talking pure surface area. So if the rat searches the whole area of its territory and the very last bit of it happens to be the button that he's walking over that frees Scott, it would take almost seven years. It's a lot, but it's nowhere close to what I was actually expecting. I was expecting this to be on the probability of, like, never. In order for the rat to come across Scott's button in five years, like the movie shows, he would need to hit that button within the first 1,825 days. Based on our calculations, there's actually an unbelievable 54.7% chance that it could do that. I can't believe I'm saying it, but it's better than a coin toss that a single rat would step on a button that frees a guy from the quantum realm. But that's not all. If we keep factoring things in, we can actually do a lot better. Remember, Scott is not just counting on one rat. He's counting on 50 covering the same territory because they share the same nest. So if we rerun our calculations based on the idea that 50 rats are each searching independently, our five-year search actually gets a lot more optimistic. If a single rat's odds of randomly freeing Scott are a little over 50%, the odds of one of 50 rats rambling, stumbling into freeing Scott are a staggering 99.99 99.99997%. I suppose you could say that the rat is inevitable. Even if we are less optimistic about the future of the rat population and decide to Thanos snap the number used in our previous estimate and do the calculations based on a smaller number of rats, like 10 rats traveling at their slowest speeds and only hitting this spot once in their lifetime, the odds of him getting found in five years is still 99.94%. And that is with us repeatedly taking the low estimates on every step of this process. Doctor Strange might have seen 14,605 futures and only one path to victory, but out of those 14,605 futures, 14,601 of those futures involve Scott being freed by a rat and only four of them with Scott trapped forever in the quantum realm or just freed by a hippie looking for a new van instead of a rat. I mean, this is San Francisco we're talking about. So at the end of the day, the odds might not have been on the side of the Avengers, but they were certainly on the side of Ant-Man. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And looking at the Avengers lineup, you know what's missing? I mean, we've got ourselves Arrow Man, Thunder God, Tiny Man, Large Man, Living Tree, and Mr. America 2.0. It seems like you got most of your bases covered, but oh no, my friends, you've got yourself one key weakness with the team as it's currently set up. You're missing a hacker. I mean, we just just lost our tech genius, and that sentient laser computer guy died shortly before that. Cause here's the thing, my friends, without the proper online protection, all the super strength in the world isn't gonna help when your identity gets stolen and your bank account gets cleaned out. Luckily, you don't need to be on Earth 616 to find an appropriate hero, he already exists here, in this universe, via our sponsor for today's episode, Nord VPN. Nord is a superhero in lots of different ways. Nord uses thousands of super fast servers across 60 countries, all working to circumvent firewalls, encrypt your data usage, and ultimately keep your activity invisible online, regardless of whether you're using a tablet, a phone, or a computer. If you torrent or do any sort of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, a VPN is a must in order to de-identify your IP address. Nord is basically like Aquaman, except instead of fish, it's able to summon the power of international servers to rescue your data. But Nord is also no longer just about online protection.
protection. With the passing of Article 13 over in Europe, a VPN is actually going to become more important than ever before, because a VPN will help you get around region-specific restrictions. So you can still watch content like this show, content that uses other people's IP in fair UC ways, even if the governments of their respective regions don't necessarily see it that way. Thanks to NordVPN, a few clicks and your internet connection suddenly looks like it's in a completely different part of the world, a part of the world that's not subject to such strict rules around IP usage. One subscription to Nord gets you coverage across six different devices with unlimited bandwidth. So go to nordvpn.com slash film theory right now and get yourself 75% off a three-year subscription. And then once you're checking out, you can use the code film theory again and get yet another month completely free. It's an investment in yourself. It's an investment in your online security. And also your support of Nord is an investment in us because it means that they still want to partner with us, which helps us cover the bills. So thank you so much. And thank you to Nord for their continued support. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a few more thoughts in Endgame I gotta start scripting out, cause like I said, this movie had a lot to cover. But more on that next episode.